Uh, yes, children. This chapter indigo we have already done. Okay, we did this chapter and now the revision is going to be started. Indigo chapter written by Louis Fisher. So this chapter, Louis Fisher, uh, Louis Fisher is the one who was an American journalist. He was very fond of Mahatma Gandhi and uh, he wrote this biography on him. The one who was born somewhere in 1896 and he died in 1970, an American journalist. So he wrote a biography on Mahatma Gandhi uh, and it was the life of Mahatma Gandhi. And uh, this chapter Indigo is an excerpt from this biography. So this Louis Fisher wrote this biography uh, thereby you know with his with interactions with gandhi he used to talk to him and he uh, saw the way gandhi used to work for the for the independence of india so it's not that he got influenced by somebody else somebody else told him about gandhi he himself saw how gandhi was working he himself he wasn't was a witness to the way gandhi was so convincing the way he used to work his effective leadership the way he made you know india pave towards this towards independence that was something which louis fisher was greatly influenced by and he wrote upon gandhi right so here when we would come to know about gandhi then it's not uh, through second person or through the account of somebody who got to know what gandhi was he himself saw him okay he talked to him and uh, found it's not somebody who is living in some other part of the world will not be influenced by somebody just for nothing okay we might get influenced by somebody who is with us near us on various grounds on religious grounds or this or that but the people those who are you know not native to this place okay those kinds of people don't get influenced by somebody for nothing he had something so here in this chapter we are going to explore we are going to see like what Gandhi actually was, how Gandhi became, uh, he, how he became to be known as the father of the nation. Nowadays, there are so many, you know, controversies on what Gandhi is, this or that. Let us not politicize Gandhi. Let us not make Gandhism as a part of politics. Gandhism is far, far above what these petty differences, you know, these people are able to create nowadays. So Gandhi is above all party politics, politics or whatever the diplomacy we can talk about. Okay, so Gandhism is all above religions. He just doesn't belong to just one religion. So in this particular extract, basically, if you, uh, if one feels like one can go through through the whole biography, the life of Mahatma Gandhi, but this very extract will give us a complete, you know, view of what Gandhi was how he worked, what his methodology of work was, or what his philosophy of life was. So how he came to be known as a great leader of the world, not just of India. People uh, all over the world, you know, they worship him as a great leader. He had been, a, he had been an idol of uh, Nelson Mandela, the one who worked for the, uh, you know, independence of South Africa. Okay, the, the one who fought against racial discrimination in that country, he followed what the doctrines of Gandhi only. So what Gandhi was, that is what we'll come to know through this chapter. Okay, so very in the very beginning, I would suggest you people to, uh, to not to consider Gandhi from any political front. Forget all about politics, forget all about diplomacies or hypocrisies. Let us just talk about Gandhism and Gandhi. Okay, Gandhism has nothing to do with any religion. Gandhism has nothing to do with any one particular country. He worked for the betterment of the humanity and uh, especially for India because he was an Indian, right? So this is a very uh, chapter is an excerpt from, the from his biography. 
so here in this chapter we are basically going to read or study about how gandhi helped champaran uh, peasants how he helped those oppressed farmers live a life of dignity and eventually this champaran episode became uh, to be known as it came to be known as a turning point in gandhi's life also because before this indigo movement before this champaran movement gandhi was not much popular in india itself even gandhi himself did not know india gandhi started knowing india from this movement it's not that he started this movement uh, with a with a vision that he would become a great leader with a vision that he would become uh, a, a, you know a freedom fighter this and that so nothing of that sort happened it just happened naturally but yes when it happened then gandhi started giving his best to the to the humanity to the indians so this story starts from so basically what this chapter is about if i just basically focus on indigo then it's a uh, first of all it's about uh, gandhi's struggle for freedom not just of india not of the whole india but of the uh, poor farmers or the poor peasants of champaran so from here gandhi got to become a become an effective leader the one whose method was that of argumentation and negotiation he could have he could give convincing argumentation and he could, could negotiate and he would come to the solutions 100% solutions before i go into details of the chapter i would like to talk about gandhi like gandhi as a lonely representative of indians would face many english okay he would be alone on one side as indian representative and on the other side of the table there would be the british representatives the landlords and he would face them all alone because he knew that he had truth with them he had truth with him and what truth not of abstract kinds he believed in the evidences he believed in witnesses so he had evidences with him he had witness with him he had documents with him he believed in complete documentation because he was a lawyer basically okay he had studied he had done law so being an advocate being a lawyer he knew how to handle the diplomatic people he knew how to handle them and the best way to handle any person in the world is having evidence in your favor and when you have the right complete documents you don't need to be afraid of anyone you don't need to be worried about anything you don't need to be uh, need to have any tension you don't need 100 people being with you when you are right when you are true when you have the proof with you about your truthfulness you don't need to worry about anything that is what he proved the struggle of 1857 freedom the struggle of independence in 1857 failed because then we did not have gandhi there but in 1947 we had gandhi with us okay it's not that it was only gandhi who brought independence no there were hundreds more freedom fighters very very prominent ones were there no need to say like uh, only gandhi i am not saying this but because we are talking about gandhi now but here and it becomes very very important to mention that gandhi his philosophy was unique and his philosophy was like number one non violence without using violence without becoming ag uh, aggressive without becoming you know um, uh, without using any underhand means to take you know independence you can get independence thereby being truthful thereby having the witness or the or the evidences in your favor and he was like always the one who told his countrymen to remain non violent he told his people to remain uh, at peace because he knew how to get independence right so this very chapter is a concrete proof like uh, 
the mightiest of the people can be defeated when you have truth with you where if with non violence you can win everyone but yes what you need to have the most with you is education you must you must have that uh, skill with which you are able to defeat anyone so gandhi was able to defeat the britishers with his wit with his intelligence also i must say okay so let's start what what this chapter is about so in the end this chapter is about like how gandhi became a very effective leader leader what are the qualities of an effective leadership so that is the basic thing we'll be learning by the end of the chapter the qualities of a great leader we'll come to know from this chapter we'll also come to know like how gandhi turned out turned out to be the greatest of all leaders not only in india but in the whole world we'll also come to know like what his methodology was what was his method of working how did he work what was his style of working okay and at the most we'll also come to know how did he turn out to be the most convincing leader how was he able to convince the britishers okay the britishers accepted their defeat from him the britishers those who were so egoist even they had to accept that gandhi was uh, you know right for the britishers prestige was most important thing mind it and gandhi made them accept that they were wrong it it was something it was only gandhi who could do this it's very easy to uh, let yourself be killed but it's very difficult to let others realize that it is their mistake and that is what only gandhi could do no one else could but again i'm saying there it's not about the question like was it only gandhi who brought independence that's not the point it's it was only because of the sacrifices because of the policy of so many freedom fighters okay because of whom we are breathing in the in the air of independence otherwise this might have been just a dream so what gandhi did that was something revolutionary so let's see let's see some glimpses of gandhi's way of working gandhi's method as a leader okay the chapter's name is indigo what is indigo crop. indigo crop. is a commercial crop which uh, which is meant to dye the crops so here indigo is like in the especially it happened in champaran let me first tell you like what was going on in champaran at that time this issue is somewhere uh, 1916s and all in those days in champaran the land was divided into two parts okay the land was you know owned by the british landlords british landlords had further given this land to the indian farmers for cultivation whose land it was of britishers they had given this land for uh, labor work to indian farmers so they had told the indian farmers to grow 15% to grow indigo on 15% of their land so if it was a field if it was a field the farmers were supposed to grow 15% of it with indigo and this 15% of whole indigo the british used to take as rent rest of the land crop would be of farmers so 15% was too much so 15% of the indigo the farmers were supposed to give to the british landlords as rent it was by old agreement it was going on mind it children even this was no less it was also very miserable for farmers because indigo crop would make the land infertile do you know this barren, barren. so wherever the indigo crop would be done for one year that land would become barren useless for the next year but farmers would have to give 15% of the indigo crop as rent to the britishers each year you can imagine the condition what what might be the condition of the farmers then but the farm it was going on but then in 1917 if i'm not wrong germans started growing indigo okay 
the Britishers started getting synthetic indigo from Germans. And that synthetic indigo was far better than the indigo which the Indian farmers were growing in their fields. Now the British farmers, Britishers, they did not want Indian indigo because that much they were able to get from the German. Now Indian indigo was not required. So they asked farmers to give them compensation in cash. They told them like, we don't want indigo, give us compensation in cash. Now this was very irksome for the Indian farmers because whatever the way the on 15% of the land, whatever the indigo they used to have, they would just give it to the farmers, Britishers. But when they were asked to give the compensation in the form of cash, from where would they bring cash? Giving cash to the Britishers would mean that they would have to sell their crop, which they use, they would have it for their own purpose. Okay, the crop which they would be yielding for their own use, it means that they'll have to sell that. If they would sell that, whatever the money they would get, that they'll have to give to the Britishers, then what would they eat? So there the farmers started getting big problem. There some farmers, those who were illiterate, they, they started doing this. But how did they, how would they give 15%? How would they give the cash to the Britishers? They would borrow money from the landlords and they would give the money to the landlords as compensation for cash, for indigo. Was that easy? You can imagine for one year, they might do this for two years, but because they were illiterate and they were afraid that if they would not do this, then the Britishers might do anything to them. So they were afraid, they were snubbed, they were oppressed, they were doing even when they were dying of hunger. Some farmers at that time went to courts. They hired lawyers and they went to court and they filed a case against British landlords. Got it? But those kinds of farmers were very less. And one such farmer who did not accept this system as such was Rajkumar Shukla. He is going to be the main character of this very indigo. So Rajkumar Shukla, he was one of those farmers who was oppressed. He was also supposed to give compensation for indigo to the British landlords. But from where would he do this? He was already starving. He was already dying of hunger. From where would he give the cash to the Britishers? And he realized that in the courts, the things were of no use because he did not have money to go to court. From where would he give money to the lawyers? So he went to Kanpur. He went to Gandhi, who was already attending a conference, conference there. He asked, he asked somebody like he wants help for this kind of case. And somebody told him like, talk to Gandhi. At that time, Gandhi was not a very famous person otherwise. But people like uh, the people, those who were the friend circle and all, they might be knowing like Gandhi was a, was a law lawyer. He might help him. So Rajkumar Shukla went to Gandhi at somebody's recommendation and told Gandhi the whole story of Champaran. Gandhi was so moved by the story of Rajkumar Shukla that he promised to help him, that he promised that he would go to Champaran to help him. But at that time, Gandhi was very busy. He told him that he would be busy up till next six months. He had so many appointments. But Rajkumar Shukla was very, you know, uh, he was very adamant. He wanted Gandhi to take, to, he wanted that he should go with him to Champaran, Bihar. So Gandhi was impressed by the tenacity of Rajkumar Shukla and agreed to go with him on a particular date. Then Gandhi fixed the appointment. He told him like on that particular date, on that at that particular time, you come to me and I'll go with you to Champaran. And on that exact date and exact time, Rajkumar Shukla was there at, with Gandhi. He told him, sir, let's move. The point is like Rajkumar Shukla was so determined. He was so tenacious. He was so like particular about getting the work done from Gandhi. He didn't leave Gandhi. So Gandhi was very impressed. So the point is like Rajkumar Shukla. So these kinds of people are required to seek out the, like 
when thousands of the people have a problem they all want solution but only one person has the guts to to approach the right person so he was the one who so rajkumar shukla is a person who made gandhi who made karamchand mohandas karamchand gandhi become mahatma gandhi actually right so gandhi started moving with rajkumar shukla to bihar so it's not that gandhi reached to straight away champaran first of all gandhi reached muzaffarpur before he reached muzaffarpur he had already telegraphed uh, jb kriplani who was a professor at college there gandhi telegraphed jb kriplani that he would be reaching there at that time so jb kriplani along with his some students reached the station to escort him so why did gandhi reach muzaffarpur because he wanted to collect evidences to what to the issue or to the case which was addressed by rajkumar shukla gandhi had only got oral information from rajkumar shukla and it's not that gandhi did not believe it gandhi knew that rajkumar shukla was right and should be given justice not only rajkumar shukla the other farmers should be given justice but if you want justice you cannot just have it on uh, abstract grounds you need to have the proof so gandhi went to muzaffarpur from there he collected evidences against britishers what do you think what kind of the evidences might be required for this kind of fight come on what do you think what kind of evidences might be required for this kind of fight evidences i'm talking about evidence documents documents are required what kind of documents you think might gandhi have collected he might have got the registries of the land gandhi knew that the britishers cannot be the owners of indian lands how can the britishers be the owners of indian lands the indian lands might be of the indians only so he got the documents he started collecting documents okay so he started collecting the documents favoring the farmers and against the britishers and when he reached champaran the whole, uh, then you know he told like one thing was there he uh, before he reached champaran he also went to the house of rajender prasad rajender prasad was a very famous lawyer of bihar at that time and uh, when he and rajender prasad was the one who later on became the president of indian national congress also so he reached over there then rajender prasad was not at home he had gone out of town rajender prasad servants knew rajkumar shukla as the champion of poor farmers but they did not know who gandhi was got it so the poor farmers welcomed rajkumar shukla and they treated gandhi uh, considering that he might be an untouchable so gandhi was not allowed to draw water from the well that was another instance where gandhi experienced untouchability gandhi did not react gandhi was not an untouchable but he could make out like what might be the uh, mental condition of the people those who are untouchable and the way they are treated so he kept that in mind anyways from there he proceeded he reached champaran he had already been collecting the evidences and all so he reached champaran and uh, when he reached champaran he was given the notice to appear in the court he told people one thing because uh, up till now no one would ever be with anyone who ever was against the britishers no one would ever shelter any person against britishers that was a norm then but then gandhi told people two things that number one no one no outsider has any right to tell us where we have to go he was asked to leave champaran he was asked to leave motihari by the britishers but he he questioned like how can an indian be questioned on an indian land and britishers have no right to tell an indian like where the indians can go and where they cannot go was he right or not so it was for the first time that somebody was telling britishers that they have no right to tell indians that they are they are outsiders gandhi was asked to leave champaran because he was considered as an outsider 
Gandhi was told that you are an outsider and leave Bihar, Champaran. Then Gandhi gave an answer, like how can he be an outsider in India? He's an Indian. Like it were, it were the Britishers who were outsiders. So he questioned the Britishers stance. Then he told the Indians that the worst thing, that the best way to become, uh, to gain your right is to shun fear. Like so far you will be afraid, you will not be able to get anything. The biggest enemy of humanity is their fear. So when you are living in your own land, when it is, it is yours, no need to be afraid of anyone. And he told the Britishers that they don't have any right to tell the Indians like where the Indians have to go or not. So this way, he started the fight against the Britishers. Though he did not become aggressive, he never ever became violent. So here the description, you know, we need to go through once again. So though we had done the chapter earlier in, in details, but right now I can only tell you a few pages which you need to read again and again. Look at the text if you have got. So see this, uh, Gandhi decided to first visit, first go to Muzaffarpur, which was en route to Champaran to obtain more complete information about the conditions than Shukla was capable of imparting. So Shukla could not give complete information because he was an illiterate, illiterate farmer. So in order to gather evidences and all, he went to Muzaffarpur. Okay, and already he had sent a telegraph to telegram to J.B. Kriplani and J.B. Kriplani on 15th April 1917, he was waiting along with his students at the station for Gandhi to reach. So Gandhi stayed there for two days in the home of Professor Malkani, a teacher in Kamen school. J.B. Kriplani along with his students received him from the station and from there he was escorted to the house of Professor Malkani, who was a government teacher then. So at that time, it was not possible, it was not easy for anyone to give shelter or to give a home to somebody who was, uh, who was against the militias. So Gandhi says that it was an extraordinary thing in those days, Gandhi commented for a government professor to harbor a man like me. In similar localities, the Indians were afraid to show sympathy for advocates of home rule. So Indians were afraid of showing sympathy to the people of, to the people who advocated home rule. What is home rule? Independence. So news of Gandhi's advent and the nature of his mission spread quickly through Muzaffarpur and to Champaran. So when you are, when you are doing something right, when your, when your purpose is selflessness, then everybody comes to know about it very soon. So the news of Gandhi's arrival and the news of his mission. What was Gandhi's mission? Gandhi's mission was to, yes, to provide justice to the poor farmers. So that mission, that news spread like wildfire in the whole Champaran at Muzaffarpur. Then what happened? Sharecroppers, who are the sharecroppers? The farmers who had to share the crop with the Britishers. So the sharecroppers, uh, they uh, they began arriving on foot and by conveyance to see their ch champion. So the farmers started approaching Gandhi to see him. They wanted to see like who this pers person is. So Muzaffarpur lawyers called on Gandhi to brief him. They frequently represented peasants group in court. So the lawyers also came to Gandhi and they told Gandhi like uh, uh, the they told him about the efforts they were making to fight the case. And there the lawyers were scolded by Gandhi because those lawyers were taking huge fee, hefty fee from the farmers. At that time when farmers went to court, remember some farmers went to court and then they were taken high fee by the lawyers. Who were the lawyers? Indian lawyers. Indian lawyers, they took high fee from the farmers, the poor farmers. And Gandhi scolded them. Like, don't you have a sense of shame? How could you take fee from your own brothers against the Britishers? So the lawyers were ashamed of themselves that they being the residents of Bihar could not help their own brothers. But Gandhi being an outsider had come from that place to this place 
to help the poor farmers. Got it? So they Gandhi first of all set an example. Like number one, be united. Gandhi gave for the first time the lesson of unity and fearlessness to Indians. The biggest problem amongst Indian before this time is that they were not united and they were not fearless. 1857 struggle failed because of these two reasons. And Gandhi brought unity and fearlessness among poor people. And now when, the, when Gandhi will be summoned in the court, then Gandhi will go alone. He will not have any tension. But the whole Champaran came there and the whole of the court premises was full of people. And when, and then Britishers asked Gandhi, like, please control the crowd. See, the Britishers were asking, in a way it is like when police has to arrest a criminal and the criminal, the police is asking the criminal to regulate the crowd. The point is that here the criminal, Gandhi was not a criminal. Gandhi was right. So the Britishers told Gandhi, like, please regulate the crowd first, then you come in the boat. And Gandhi did this. Otherwise, Gandhi, had it not been Gandhi or had it been somebody else, that person would have told the crowd, like, a bit of a court ko jala do. You know, they might have done this. But Gandhi told crowd, beta, become controlled. Sit down, let me go inside and let me fight the case. And at that time, there was no surety what Britishers would do with Gandhi. Because the Britishers, whenever they would see that somebody was emerging as a great leader, they would not, they, they did not let that person live. Same happened with uh, Bhagat Singh also. But how Gandhi was able to survive? Because Gandhi, when he went inside, he acted very diplomatically. The Britishers were under pressure. Like if they will, if they will do something wrong with Gandhi, the public outside will not leave them. And if they will leave Gandhi for no reason, then their prestige will be at risk then it will be their insult. Gandhi made Britishers have conflict like this. So Britishers had no choice. And Britishers told him, okay, you apply for bail. See this? The police asking the criminal, okay, go for bail, apply for bail. Gandhi refused. He said, why will I apply for bail? Abhi karo case. Then Britishers, because to keep themselves, you know, to keep their self-respect sustained, they released Gandhi without bail. He was so diplomatic. Because Gandhi had gone to Bihar, Champaran, to fight for the cause of farmers. And when he reached there, then all farmers started approaching him. Why approaching him? Because he told farmers to submit their documents. All farmers started coming to him, going. So the whole place was full of activity. And Gandhi would even visit a person who was uh, injured by the Britishers. So on the way, he was asked, like, better go back. Gandhi said, why will I go back? But Gandhi disobeyed the law and he wrote on the summon that I will disobey. And he explained it very precisely that his purpose to disobey the law was not that he was disobedient, that he did not respect the law. But for him, the law of conscience, the law of humanity was more important than the law of this he didn't say like law of Britishers, because if he would obey the law of the Britishers at that time, then he would have to go back from where he had come. And these farmers would be left to starve. And for the sake of poor farmers, he did not want to leave Bihar. So he said, I will not. Because he had signed, he had written that I will disobey the law. He was asked to come to court. That you disobeyed. And when he, uh, in the court, the way he was able to fight, that is exemplary. Okay, you'll all start uh, like looking at Gandhi from another perspective. Gandhi was never wrong. Gandhism was never wrong. But is that? Politicians, you know, they do, they have started Gandhism. Gandhism has now been acquired all over uh, different states. If he wanted India to be done, Okay, let me know the next class.